Hi everyone. Um, so this is going to be my presentation for the Backles virtual conference, um, Crisis in Contemporary Writing. And um, specifically my paper is part of the roundtable discussion on um, contemporary conversations, I think it's called. And given our current lockdown situation, you may have to excuse the very exuberant student neighbours who I have. Um, who I believe have just started having a party. So there might be a bit of uh, funky music in the background. Okay, so I'm just gonna find my slides for you. Um, share screen, there we go. And let's get those up and ready. Okay. So um, what can I usefully say about the theme of crisis? I've been studying crisis in one form or another for many years now in my work on speculative and science fictions, uh, post-apocalyptic narratives and the uneven temporalities unleashed by rampant globalisation, neoliberalism, austerity politics and environmental catastrophe. And I've developed a particular interest in um, the relationship between the pastoral and the apocalyptic, which connects to my, um, I guess what you might call my formal training as a critical theorist and as someone who specialized in utopian philosophy and utopian theory. And so reading novels from science fiction's experimental new wave period in the late 1960s and into the early 1970s, and I would include among uh, these texts, things like Doris Lessing's um, Memoirs of a Survivor, uh, J.G. Ballard's eco-catastrophe fiction in um, uh, The Drowned World, <clears throat> The Burning World and The Crystal World. It struck me when I was reading them that these novels had these odd moments of pleasure amidst the societal wreckage, utopian glimpses of a world beyond capitalist productivity. It was problematic uh, for sure, but it was also weirdly pastoral. Um, and they presented us with these escapist enclaves in which survivors would maybe return to the English countryside or would eke out a pre-industrial life of agricultural subsistence with the simpler rhythms of um, slow diurnal repetition and seasonal change, something that we've had to perhaps rediscover during lockdown. And I guess you could add to these new wave texts some of the cosy catastrophes things like John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids um, and the Kraken. And I gradually became aware that contemporary literature, or um, I was periodizing it under the rubric of 21st century literature, was deliberately engaging with these earlier ideas of both the apocalyptic and of the pastoral. And so I was looking at a kind of caucus of texts, which would include um, some of the covers you can see here, Jim Crace's The Pest House, Maggie G's The Flood, Sam Taylor's work in The Island at the End of the World, but also his earlier novel, The Republic of Trees. In Bernardine Evaristo's reversal of the transatlantic slave trade in Blonde Roots, which turns London into a torrid jungle. In Emily St. John Mandel's award-winning post-pandemic um, novel, Station Eleven. Megan Hunter's hallucinatory um, prose poem text, The End We Start From, that was sort of written like a poem, but actually was published as a novel. In Susan Butler's Signet, or in Sophie McIntosh's fascinatingly ambiguous The Water Cure uh, from 2018. So I've written about many of these texts, um, approaching them within uh, a utopian hermeneutic framework in which I'm trying to excavate what I think is the often latent utopian content uh, of what I would call moments of possibility. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, textual moments in which stylistic and generic registers are um, established <laughs> and then subsequently sort of cleaved apart um, readers' generic expectations are confounded, and the authors are clearly experimenting with um, formal techniques, specifically relating, I think, to the experience of temporality, uh, something that occurs when the so-called ordinal time of capitalism comes to a stop, and a plurality of alternative possible times and the social worlds that contain them come into being. More recently, I've started to think about this idea under the rubric of um, what I'm calling Arcadian revenge, 
And for me, this contains the seeds of a method that can help us uncover, uncover sorry, narratives of eco-catastrophe. There's obviously um, a boom in apocalyptic literature, post-apocalyptic narratives, climate change fictions, cli-fi, and so on. Um, but for me, I think um, eco-catastrophe is very helpful because it comes out of the science fiction tradition. It is definitely speculative rather than the sort of lyrical realist tradition where we sometimes find climate change fiction. Um, and it's doing something quite different, I think, from um, lots of post-apocalyptic narratives. The term Arcadian revenge signals the biblical underpinnings of ideas of Arcadia, the paradise or garden constructed in opposition to wilderness, bestiality, and non-human threats to human domestication and order. Ideas of the God of vengeance echo throughout the Old and New Testaments and are secularized in the biocentric, deep ecological thinking of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and this is where we find a really interesting sort of political moment, I guess, um, where um, activists are privileging the biosphere above humanity um, and controversially um, they're imagining this idea of a kind of world without us where human extinction has taken place and I'm really fascinated by that moment of deep ecological sort of anarchism if you like. There's an obvious tension there between um, the kind of bizarre attractiveness of an idea of welcoming our own demise as a species and I would suggest that the science fictional canon has lots of precursor and earlier examples of, of this sort of apocalyptic pleasure, this deliberate reveling in the disaster itself. Um, and the deep ecological credentials uh, are used then um, to stage a warning uh, to our hubris and our complicity in the ongoing destruction of the planet. But this kind of thinking also paradoxically maintains a distinction between humans and the non-human, whether that be ecological systems, animals, organic and inorganic, inorganic elements, um, and so on. And so set against anthropocentrism, uh, which privileges the human, humanism, I guess, if you like, this kind of anti-humanist approach perpetuates an idea of human exceptionalism um, by suggesting that humanity is separate from the natural, humanity should be punished, and maybe the world would be better off without us. So these ideas were part of um, a sabbatical um, that I had at the end of last year and into this spring, um, thinking about and gathering materials on anti-humanism, post-humanism, um, eco-catastrophe narratives and science fiction. And then COVID-19 hit. Its devastation was weirdly familiar to me and I think to many other scholars and fans who read or enjoy watching science fiction and disaster narratives. I found myself thinking like Lauren from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, um, which was published back in 1993, and there was a follow-up Parable of the Talents in 1998. Am I supposed to pack an emergency backpack in this crisis? Should I stockpile certain items? No, the resounding answer from the news was telling me definitely don't go out and try and buy any toilet roll in the near future. Um, I did succumb and I bought a Wendy house because just the terror of this idea of impending lockdown with an 18 month old toddler and how on earth was I going to keep her entertained whilst under conditions of lockdown, I guess really frightened me. Um, and I think we were all kind of panicked in those early weeks of sort of late February, early March. And like everyone, I couldn't turn off the news. Um, I started noticing articles that attempted to put this question of the Chinese wet markets um, and the consumption of wildlife in context. And there was a lot of very problematic and racist sort of um, discussion of you know, Chinese wet markets. But actually the analyses that I was following were, um, which have been circulating more and more, were thinking about the ecological kind of systemic context of global capitalism. In fact, the one that I've put here, I found just this morning, it was published yesterday in The Guardian by um, the environment editor, Damien Carrington, um, and it outlined a public statement produced by the UN, the WHO, and the World Wildlife Fund um, International Organization. Uh, and the article notes that pandemics such as coronavirus are the result of humanity's destruction of nature. The illegal and unsustainable wildlife trade, as well as the devastation of forests and other wild places, were still the driving forces behind the increasing number of diseases leaping from wildlife to humans. 
um, uh, one of the WWF reports that came out this week warned, um, and I quote, the risk of a new wildlife to human disease emerging in the future is higher than ever, with the potential to wreak havoc on health economies and global security, end quote. So um, this pandemic, COVID-19, could be the first in a cycle of pandemics. And this moment that we're living in is often the moment you get in a narrative like um, you know, John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids or the Kraken, where there's just a few paragraphs between sort of capitalist normality and whatever the apocalyptic situation is in the future. And we're living through this kind of transitional moment where we change from one global world order to another. And I guess um, the question then that we're uh, discussing on this roundtable is how can contemporary literature respond to this global crisis? What imaginative and critical tools do such narratives give us? Um, and I would uh, argue for a usage of the term narrative that is the most inclusive and the broadest. Right now, I'm looking at novelistic texts, but I'm also looking at cinematic and televisual texts. I'm interested in graphic narratives, art, sculpture, installation. I'm even thinking about music and sonic narratives and sonic cartographies. So given um, my own research interests, um, I think this question needs refining a little bit from all of contemporary literature. And I would phrase it as what imaginative and speculative tools do utopian narratives offer? And that leads us then to think, well, how are we going to define utopian narratives in the 21st century? Before I answer this question, though, I think it's worth pointing out that the discourse of utopianism has seen a massive resurgence in the last 12 years. Um, and I'm periodizing that really going back to the 2008 global financial crisis, which formalized a long economic downturn and the political and social retrenchment into austerity in the UK as well as elsewhere but also particularly since the cycle of protests, occupations and struggles in 2011. And in our UK higher education context, they were preceded by the late winter 2010 anti-tuition fees protests. And these protests were really unlike anything that we've seen since the Cultural Revolution in 1968, which followed the May protests at the Sorbonne in Paris and saw the alliance between student radicals and exhausted workers. I mean, arguably, I'm particularly attuned to this so-called utopian vocabulary of possibility. Um, and I, I, I mean that in the sense that we all sort of have our own antennae that we attune to our specific scholarly and intellectual interests. And, we, and once you're in the middle of a project and you start looking through that conceptual framework, you start to see examples of it everywhere. Um, but I actually don't think I'm alone in suggesting there's a resurgence of utopianism. And I think you can find evidence for this in the number of student activists and other youth-led protest movements um, since 2011 and the Occupy movements and the camps, for example, outside um, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, as well as other cities in the UK and around the world. We would also now include the Rhizomatic Decentralised Global Extinction Rebellion movement, as well as um, the Black Lives Matter campaign dating back to 2014, which has become ignited in recent weeks. And what I think what's interesting and that connects these two um, historical moments, sort of the, the last 12 years and the, the 1960s um, cycle of struggles is, is actually the utopian slogans. Another world is possible, demand the impossible, la lutte continue. In the graffiti banners and protest chants of recent years, we hear that radical energy in slogans such as give us back our future, um, particularly from the anti-tuition fees protests, calls for a general strike, assertions that, um, as you can see here, another Oakland is possible in California, that system change, um, not climate change, is what we need, that capitalism, is, capitalism isn't working, and um, I guess this is the most utopian of all, be realistic, demand the impossible, which is a direct reference to um, the graffiti seen on bridges in Paris in 1968. Since COVID-19 was named as a global pandemic, um, explicit utopian political demands that I think were previously unthinkable have suddenly become thinkable. 
Um, so this would include calls for the reduction of the length of the working day and of the working week. And these, um, of course, date back to the mid 19th century and um, socialist agitation to protect workers' rights or um, <laughs> entrench workers' rights in law. Um, calls for states to, implicate, uh, to implement a universal basic income. Uh, uh, which um, really, again, refer us back to late, the late 19th century dream of utopian socialist novels, which imagined how would we spend all of this free time? Um, what kind of creative pursuits might we be able to um, enjoy? Painting, dancing, raising our own children, cooking, cultivating aesthetic taste and desire. This brings me to um, lockdown TV, um, a weird new genre that no one foresaw. Um, and I think the best example of lockdown TV that I've seen has been um, Grayson Perry's art club on Channel 4, which has been filmed with his wife, Philippa. And I think that this program has clearly utopian overtones in the sense that it encourages us into the everyday practice of aesthetic pleasure, the non-utilitarian expression of creativity for its own sake, as well as um, the forging of a community brought together through um, the simple but difficult desire to capture everyday lived experience. And they've been receiving paintings and, and photographs, portraits and so on of people in lockdown at home, looking out of their own window, looking in the mirror, just looking in the corner of their room and trying to rediscover anew their everyday mundane lived experience. All of this has been slowed right down to a decelerated temporality of lockdown, where we're forced to spend all of our time indoors, or if we're lucky enough, maybe on a balcony or in a back garden or on our own front doorstep. In one episode, I was particularly struck when Anthony, Anthony Gormley talked about the opportunity to dream under lockdown. And I can't help reading this in the context of utopian theory, um, and particularly the philosophy of the German thinker Ernst Bloch, um, whose work I've been reading for many years, and whose magisterial three-volume Principle of Hope, which was written in the 1920s, but um, wasn't published until the 1950s, and actually wasn't translated in English until the late 1980s, um, focuses explicitly on the everyday experience of wishful dreams and how they contain this kind of latent utopian content or possibility. Perhaps then lockdown will unlock strong desires for more free time and less relentless capitalist productivity, things that harbour utopian potential and might seep into our post-coronavirus life. We might push harder for the reduction of the length of the working week or for universal basic income to ensure that everybody can afford to live in an extremely uncertain economic long-term, medium-term situation. And beyond these political objectives, I think a show like Art Club could help us recover the sense of fulfillment and community, carving out the space to breathe outside of the extraordinarily anxiety ridden day to day pace of life during this crisis. Um, whether that's a kind of political anxiety and anxiety about the pandemic itself, whether it's caused by ongoing austerity, which is only going to get more exacerbated in the years to come or under the shadow of the looming eco catastrophe. Um, I think that the, the Perry's show and the National Collective Project to um, curate an exhibition of lockdown art is constructing a utopian narrative. But to return to my earlier question about the um, imaginative and speculative tools that utopian narratives offer, um, I'll, I'll just talk through the following remarks. For me then, um, a utopian narrative need not be what you can see on the screen here, which is to say a narrative centered around the discovery of a utopian society or kingdom, a kind of enclave within the world of the text. These are traditionally located at the edges of the known world of capitalist circuits of trade and exchange, as in King Utopus's Island in Thomas More's originary 1516 text, Utopia, or maybe in some Uchronian future that we might reach by means of mesmerism, or perhaps uh, as we find in Edward Bellamy's um, Looking Backward, or maybe we'll take a nap and we'll wake up in the future as um, H.G. Wells's protagonist in The Sleeper Awakes did, or as um, William Guest did in um, William Morris's News from Nowhere. 
Or there are narratives, of course, where um, you steal an aeroplane uh, and then land amidst a sort of secret separatist society hidden in the mountains, as we have in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Her Land. Or you might slip into some Arctic whirlpool and wash down <laughs> concentric circles into the centre of the earth, as we find in Mary Bradley Lane's Mizora. Or you even um, uh, fall down a mine shaft to discover the utopian hollow earth below in um, Edward Bulwer Lytton's The Coming Race. Um, those are all sort of late 19th century uh, um, classic kind of utopias, if you like. Or perhaps into the 1960s, 1970s period where scholars talk about critical utopias, you might hallucinate while incarcerated in a prison cell as the protagonist does in Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time. Um, and that's how you um, arrive at the utopian community. Um, so those are kind of classical utopian texts. But actually what I'm thinking about is um, a utopian narrative which can also include lyrical realist texts that aren't written in that speculative tradition of science fiction. These are novels then which are set in mimetic and recognisable worlds, but which also contain non-contemporaneous moments of disjunctive um, stylistic turns, generic discontinuities and experimental narratological features that sort of punctuate what is otherwise a relatively realist, straightforward sort of narrative. Um, and that's what I mean by developing a utopian hermeneutic to help us identify these kind of moments within these realist texts. And in order to make um, this point, um, because they're not explicitly perhaps about the idea of utopia or there's no journey to the utopian island, I've had to spend some years building this hermeneutic um, so that it is workable and that it helps us uncover and um, start to analyze and explore utopian moments. Um, so I guess you could say as, it's as much a strategy of reading as it is um, a, a taxonomic exercise. And what do these novels tell us then about crisis? I think they contain a vital message. We have to remember how to hope even when things seem at their lowest ebb. It's no coincidence that utopian and dystopian novels emerge out of the same impulse to critique their present socio-political socio conditions of production. And in fact, you should read utopias and dystopias really as um, two sides of the same coin. And students always seem a bit perplexed when I say this to them. They can't connect utopias and dystopias at all. But both of them obviously extrapolate from present circumstances into um, either the worst of all worlds in the dystopias, which are supposed to warn us against complacency, or into the best of all possible worlds um, in the utopias, which um, are meant to inspire us perhaps to be more bold and imaginative in articulating our political demands. And I think one of the things that actually gets forgotten, and this is why attentiveness to textual detail is really important, is that many of our canonical dystopias, uh, as you can see here, George Orwell's 1984, Jack London's earlier novel, The Iron Heel, and Margaret Atwood's more recent The Handmaid's Tale, uh, which is obviously undergoing an impressive renaissance right now. One of the things that often gets forgotten then is that there are paratexts and narrative frameworks in these novels, that each of these narratives actually is narrated from a post dystopian future and it looks backwards to the dystopia which is set in the novel's past. There are editors' preferences, uh, prefaces, sorry, there are afterwords, there are scholarly footnotes. And in the case of The Handmaid's Tale, there's the framework of an academic conference. You know, the story is, is, um, is an archival document being discussed at the 12th Symposium on Gileadian Studies, which is dedicated to a distant period of history. And I think attention to this kind of overlooked textual detail and the non-contemporaneous temporalities that then are constructed kind of paratextually within these novels is crucial and it reminds us of that entanglement between the utopian and the dystopian. But to come back to the question of hope then, the education of hope or what E.P. Thompson similarly referred to as the education of desire. This insists on the importance of the utopian imagination and I've just picked out for you a quote here from the British novelist um, Megan Hunter. I mentioned a moment ago um, uh, the end we start from. Yeah, the end we start from, the brain freeze for a minute. 
Um, okay, and she said in an interview a couple of years back, this might seem naive in the face of the challenge ahead, but I think that hope is actually essential if we are to take action. If there is no hope for the planet, then there is no point in doing anything. And hope for me is not the same as optimism. It isn't about conceiving of something tangible in the future that necessarily provides hope, but about recognizing the essentially unknown nature of the future, the reality of possibility. I'm gonna come back to that idea of the unknown nature of the future. So the 21st century novels that I look at um, I think have many things to teach us about utopian possibility, but also about the possible dangers of that unknown nature of the future. Um, I discussed these in um, my recent book, which was uh, on a slide a little bit earlier, Utopia in the Contemporary British Novel. It came out with Cambridge University Press last year. And some of the best examples, I think, would be something like John McGregor's use of the narratorial even in Nobody Speaks of, um, If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things, even Frank Commode described as the time of the angels. I think it gives us an ontological loosening of mimetic literary realism in moments where time stands still and the nunc movens of lived time comes into contact with the nunc stands of eternity. Or we might find it in David Mitchell's yoking together of different historical timescales. Um, so he does this famously in Cloud Atlas, which I suspect many Buckles followers um, are, perhaps have written about already or are, are in the process of writing about. And he also does it again in The Bone Clocks. Um, and we find a similar kind of structural non-contemporaneity, if you like, in the aesthetic form of Joanna Cavenna's The Birth of Love it enacts these non-simultaneous, non-contemporaneous times. It brings the ancient times before modernity into contact with the planetary scale of distant geological futures. Um, and another example I point you towards, although unfortunately I couldn't include it in my book because it's not British, which is really annoying, um, is N.K. Jemison's uh, Broken Earth fantasy trilogy um, published around 2015 to 2018. And I think that those novels do it masterfully. They blur the boundaries between the human and the geological, and they give us um, post-humanist assemblages that manage to break out of the trap of discrete subjectivity, and specifically through um, what we would call the novum in science fictional terms, the, the kind of new element in those stories is the fact that the protagonist turns from a human um, kind of into stone and so people literally become stone become uh, part of a different geological duration of planetary time so the unknown nature of the future then contains fear as well as hope after all if you think about it we're all going to grow old hopefully and we're all going to die at the subjective level each one of us then has perhaps a terrifying future unless we can make our peace with death and all literature and art, arguably throughout history, deals to some extent with the insurmountable question of our own mortality or the human condition. But I think what's specific to the utopian texts and the way that I'm reading them as utopian in recent years is that they offer this sort of ability to step outside of that discrete, disconnected trap, I would call it, of individual subjectivity. Um, and, and you can contextualise this perhaps with neoliberalism and Thatcher's call for there's no alternative and um, that sort of, I don't know, sense that we're all competitive individuals in the capitalist marketplace competing against one, one another for increasing, increasingly shrinking um, public resources and funding and things like that. What we're interested then is the chance to build properly collective relations. Although each of us will die, in the collective future we will live. And even if humanity manages to destroy itself, as science fiction writers have been imagining for more than a century, if we have a post-humanist understanding of ourselves and our place within the broader ecosphere, then surely something will live on, even if it isn't um, specifically human. The world without us is going to be just fine, as Alan Wiseman's speculative non-fiction work um, of the same title published in 2007 reveals, or um, another text I've been looking at is Homo Sapiens from 2016. It's a, it's a brilliant art film by uh, the Austrian director, Nicholas Geierhalter. And again, it, it's that speculative idea of what would the world look like without us. 
And I actually take great comfort in the idea of the world without us. I think for me, it's not about inhabiting this futile position of nihilism at a time of undeniable historical crisis. It's not about burying your head in the sand and just thinking, well, what's the point in recycling when I know that the eco-catastrophe looms? I think it's actually about looking the disaster, the apocalypse, the eco-catastrophe square on in the face. And it's about trying to identify the utopian seeds of a better world. I think it's about learning from Lauren in Octavia Butler's parable series with her self-founded earth seed religion of change process and the disillusion of human subjectivity and of human sovereignty uh, into kind of one among many agents or entities within the biosphere. And so this ties in very nicely with lots of new materialisms, new feminist materialisms, people working in animal studies and post-human, post-anthropocentric theory as well. I think it's about recognising why Kirsten Dunst's character in Lars von Trier's lush, genre-defying, end-of-the-world epic Melancholia from 2011 welcomes her own annihilation and she has this curious libidinal investment in the release that is promised by the destruction of all of humanity when the planet Melancholia finally hits Earth and everyone supposedly dies. So I think then, just to sum up, we have to move ourselves beyond the trap of the human. We have to understand, um, and by the human I mean understanding humanism where, as a power relation which pits us as superior to planetary ecos the, the planetary ecosystems on which our own survival depends. And this is where I think contemporary literature, contemporary narrative, filmic, um, cinematic, televisual, and so on, can help us to um, understand um, what it is that the speculative imagination can do. And I think this is one of the reasons why climate change fiction cli-fi is so popular right now, why so many writers are writing about these really grand problems that we're all facing. And they're seeing their work increasingly as a kind of activist intervention into campaigning for greener um, new deals, for example, or for um, uh, ecological undertakings. And I think that, the, that these narratives then help to forge effective connotations, um, sorry, it's been a long day, effective connections with global systemic problems. I think they inspire us towards hope and a commitment to action rather than just nihilism and despair. Um, that is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>